Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name's Amir Shoaib. I'm an orthopaedic surgeon at Manchester Royal Infirmary in Manchester. Um, and I'm here with uh, my friend and colleague, Rahil. Hello, uh, Rahil Tree is a, a consultant uh, in Jeddah in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And he's the head uh, of training uh, at that particular institution. So um, today we're going to be talking about damage uh, control orthopaedics which is uh, something of a hot topic, especially in trauma. And uh, we're going to kick off by going through a case. So Rahil's going to present a case to you, and we're going to have a little discussion about uh, the management points. OK, over to you, Rahil. Thanks, Amir. Welcome, everyone. We've got uh, a case we're going to kick off with, just to get a flavor of where we are at with this uh, topic. There's a bit of evolution in damage control orthopedics, and Amir is going to touch upon that in his talk. Through the course of this session, we're going to have polls being pushed to yourself. Uh, feel free to answer them, get involved. Uh, they're all completely anonymized, so uh, don't worry. And we'll be discussing the results as we go along. So here's our first case. We've got a 40-year-old who basically decides to jump off a two-story building uh, in the evening. And he is intubated at scene as he has a lowered Glasgow coma scale score and uh, the paramedics notice that both his legs are deformed and uh, they're suspecting bilateral femoral fractures. He has a head-to-toe CT and some of the images you can see below. As you can see, he seems to have a space occupying intracranial bleed and bilateral femoral shaft fractures. The chest and abdomen are normal. So Amir, what are your first thoughts for this case? Um, well, it's obviously complex because he's got uh, a serious head injury uh, and so obviously I'm worried about uh, the fact that uh, we don't want that head injury to get worse and at the same time he's got bilateral femoral fractures so I'm worried about the amount of blood that he might have lost from uh, the femoral fractures and they look like segmental quite complex femoral fractures so I'd be worried about his blood loss and whether he's hemodynamically stable or not so uh, yeah it's a co complex case. So uh, Amir is being polite. What he's actually thinking is, why did I swap my own call for tonight? Correct? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. it's, it's eight o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. So let's have a look. We'd like you to answer this question. Uh, there's a poll coming through to you. Your priority is A, B, C, D, E. C, A, B, C, D, E. Call the neurosurgeon and apply splints to both legs. So which one would you like to go for? Feel free to answer that poll and uh, we'll get to Amir's thoughts. Amir, sorry, just to uh, you know, lowering the volume on your computer because there's an echo of my voice coming through. Uh, okay, so Amir, can you just talk us through the concept of ABCDE versus CABCDE? So in one of the previous talks, we've talked about um, uh, blunt trauma and penetrating trauma and Essentially, the CABCD approach is used when you uh, are worried that the patient's going to bleed out. So, if they've got an amputated limb or they've had a penetrating trauma, and you're worried that, uh, especially if it's isolated, uh, you're not so much worried about uh, airway and breathing, but you're more worried about the fact that they're going to bleed out. And that if you go through the rigmarole of uh, formal ATLS, you might get to see and find out that you know they've lost a lot, a lot more blood while you've been assessing them. So the C is really to, if you can do something quickly to stop the bleeding, then you do that, and then you go back to the formal uh, A B C D E approach of ATLS. Um, so what we're talking about is essentially blunt injuries, but you know it, it, you could say, well, you know he's he's going to lose a lot of blood from his uh, femoral fractures. And uh, that, that's part of circulation. But because he's got head injury as well, you know, I think I'm going to be starting with uh, uh, the airway. Um, yeah. Now, calling the neurosurgeon, well, um, good luck with that. <laughs> uh, it's difficult to get hold of the neurosurgeon. And, for, and secondly, they're not going to do anything immediately that's going to change the management. Yeah. Uh, the last answer is applying splints to both legs. I think that's a sensible thing to do. Um, but 
um, your top priority? You know, you've, got to, you've got to prioritize. So I, I, I'd start with the airway. So it'd be A, B, C, D, E for me. Okay. So uh, let's look at what the audience has uh, answered. 50% have gone with C, A, B, C, D. So what they're trying to tell us is they want to control the circulation first and then, then move on to the airway. Uh, as Amir has uh, alluded to it just a moment ago, it's a good idea to do that if there is active bleeding going on and you can actually see bleeding um, from a penetrating wound. So I think we still stick to the basics of ATLS in this case. And the right answer is A, B, C, D and then uh, reassess. Yeah. Yeah, but you know there is an argument for for both. So, uh, like we've said uh, in several previous talks, it's controversial, and there might not be one right answer. But you know, as so long as you've got an approach and you stick to it, I think that's that's helpful. Absolutely. Okay, let's let's move on. So this uh, lucky for you, Amir. Uh, unlucky for you that this patient's in your uh, hospital during your on call. But lucky for you, we've got a neurosurgeon and she's on her way. Okay. So, Fantastic. Yeah. So, what are the factors that we need to, uh, which are important to avoid for the optimal management of this head injury? Is right. It... So, sorry, yeah. carry on. So, we're going to push that to our audience uh, in a moment. And uh, if you can just talk us through those, uh... is it hypotension, hypercarbia, hypoxia, or hypocarbia? Hypoxia, hypotension, hypocarbia, or hypercarbia. So I get, uh, I think we're going to flip a coin on this one. I get a feeling. Ooh. Hypocarbia, hypercarbia, hypotension, hypoxia, or hypotension, hypoxia, hypercarbia, and hypocarbia. So just to uh, quickly uh, recap, hypocarbia, reduced amount of carbon dioxide in the blood, hypercarbia, increased amount. Yeah. So what are we looking at here? What's the, what's the thought process behind this? All right. Well, what I'm thinking of is that um, when you've got a serious head injury, um, there'll be an area which is not salvageable, but and there will be an area which is healthy. And in between the two, there's an area which uh, is potentially salvageable. And the priorities that you're going to be thinking of in order to keep that bit of the brain alive, to stop it from, from dying, is to get it oxygen and to get you know, to have a decent blood pressure. So it's, it's actually pretty much the same question as the first question we had, which is, you know, how do you keep a patient alive? Well, airway, breathing, circulation. Um, so I, I think hypoxia would be my number one. And then I want to avoid hypotension because, you know, it's no good having oxygen in the blood, but not being able to um, perfuse the, uh, the brain. Now, uh, I did do a neurosurgery job many years ago, and I know that if you have too much uh, carbon dioxide in the blood, then the vessels uh, dilate. And if you have too little, then they constrict. So I'd say that I want to try and avoid the, the constriction. Um, so that's hypocarbia I try to avoid, and then hypercarbia. I think ideally you want to have um, uh, the PCO2 in the normal range rather than having any one of them. But if I had to choose the lesser of two evils, I'd say hyper hypercarbia is the lesser. So I, I'm going to go for answer number two, which is hypoxia uh, is the first thing I want to avoid, then hypotension, mm -hmm. uh, then hypocarbia and hypercarbia. Is, is that what you're thinking as well? Fantastic. And importantly, the majority of the audience seems to agree with that. So it's a happy balance we're trying to hit where there is enough perfusion uh, in the brain and there is enough oxygenation occurring as well. We don't want to sort of cause constriction of those vessels. And at the same time, we don't want to cause too much dilation and cause edema in the brain. So yes, uh, I think you're absolutely right there, Amir. Great. So let's see where we are now. So that patient came in at eight o'clock in the evening. We're now in theater at 11 that night. Okay. The patient has a heart rate of 100, a blood pressure of 120, 85. So uh, ticking along hemodynamically. The PO2 is 13 on 100% oxygen. Now, what's your choice of treatment going to be? We're going to push that poll across to our audience as well and give them a chance to uh, answer. The options are bilateral nails for those femurs. We nail the left side and put an X-fix on the right. Bilateral X-fixes or left side nailing and right side retrograde nail. So let's give the audience a moment. now. 
So this is an interesting one. What we've got to think about is this is not your box standard polytrauma. It's a head injury. Correct, Amir? Absolutely. Yeah. And how does that make us differ our management in a patient? Well, we sort of answered that in the previous question because what the things we're trying to avoid are hypoxia and we also want to avoid hypotension. Now, um, uh, I'm not, uh, even though I like to think I'm a good orthopedic surgeon, but I know that my patient's going to bleed if I, if I perform a nailing. And if I try and perform two nailings, then I'm going to make them bleed potentially a lot. And I, although in the literature it says that you know, uh, nailing uh, uh, femurs, especially bilateral femurs, is a good thing to do, less than 24 hours, th this is not the same because there's a, there's a head injury as well. And I'm mindful of the head injury changes how I would approach this. So I would say, well, I don't want to put in a nail and lose a lot of blood and also risk uh, fat emboli. And the fat emboli will you know, could potentially cause problems in the lungs. And fat emboli also can go to the brain as well. So uh, even in patients with... Um, no patent foramen ovale, so there's no connection between the left and the right heart. For some reason, which we don't understand, they can still get fat emboli in their brain. So I'd be wanting to try and avoid a further insult to the brain, and I'd want to avoid hypotension. So in this situation with the head injury, I think I might actually say, no, I'm not going to put in a nail, and I'm going to go for the external fixators um, just to, as a temporary fixation uh, so that I can protect the brain and protect the lung from uh, uh, ARDS and fat emboli syndrome. Um, I think most of the do, 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 you think the, the, do you think the timing is it's 2300? Yeah. Um, Rahil, if you, if you had to consider doing a bilateral femoral nail, would you do that at 2300? So I think you've hit the nail on the head, uh, no pun intended, that uh, the patient who has a head injury is a very different uh, kettle of fish compared to one who hasn't in a polytrauma. So we're going to look at, Amir is going to give us this talk in which he's going to explore the concept of damage control orthopedics, uh, early total care and early appropriate care. Uh, so there is a lot of literature, which uh, O'Toole's paper, which suggests that early nailing within 24 hours is a good idea, but when the head injury, it's gonna cause more insult. So I'm totally uh, with you on this one. We we sort of consider bilateral X fixes. The timing, it depends uh, on where we are at. Yes, at 11 o'clock at night, it's probably not the best time to start nailing uh, two femurs, but if this patient did not have a head injury, we wanna get in into that window within the first 24 hours where we can provide early total care so that this patient doesn't have increased uh, morbidity and mo uh, possible mortality as well, which is associated. So yes, the timing is crucial. You don't want to be starting nailings at 11, but it depends on if the patient did not have a head injury. If the patient did not have a head injury, we'd go with uh, nailings. If we had a okay. team which was appropriate and uh, uh, fairly experienced trauma surgeons doing this at that time with the staff. Right. The, th the thing that worries me about being, being late at night is that, um, you know, first of all, I might be tired the theatre team might be tired, the anaesthetist might be tired, and you know we might be thinking, well, should we do the quickest operation uh, possible? I mean, I'm just talking if there was no head injury, and you know, with bilateral nailing, you know, in the in the best of hands, you know, it's still going to take three or four hours, um, and you know, it's a, t a time of day when the least number of people in the hospital to come and help out if there's a, a problem, and. You know, at night you might not ha you might have the night staff who are not used to um, uh, performing nailing. So I think the timing also makes me worry about you know even if there was no head injury, you know maybe I'd be reluctant to to put nails in um, in the in the middle of the night because of the other factors at play. Appreciate that. I think the caveat is that we need to have a, uh, a reasonable, reasonably experienced staff in the uh, theatre or the all time. Uh, and if that's the case, then I think what's best for the patient if he does not have a head injury is... <coughs> yes, I, I, I take your point. In the real world, uh, things are slightly different. Okay, right. great. So we've, uh, that was just to give us a bit of a flavor as to this uh, topic. 
and where we are at. Uh, we've had some suggestions that we should be looking at more info before we decide as to the base excess and the lactate levels for this patient. All that's going to come in, uh, in a few moments when Amir starts uh, giving us uh, the evidence based for damage control. So over to uh, Amir on this one. Okay, so um, as always, you know, there's, uh, there isn't a black and white in orthopedics, uh, like in most of medicine, there's lots of greys. And this is uh, a really good example of uh, how, you know, things are not as clear as you would hope they were going to be. And also what we think one year changes uh, over the course of time. And 10 years later, we think things uh, are much, uh, well, we, we think uh, very differently. And we might have uh, an altered opinion on the, the same situation. So what I'm going to do in this talk is we're going to start off by looking at the origin of the term damage control, because I think that's very interesting. And there's some really good parallels uh, that we can learn from. And then look at the definition of damage control within orthopedics itself. And then what I thought we should do is basically go back um, 40, 40, 50 years and look at how damage control and the, our different approaches to dealing with the polytraumatized patient have changed. And then I want to, after going through the, the changes in damage control uh, approach, I thought perhaps we should talk about the concepts that are useful to us now and talk about how that might help us in our decision making in you know, in real life in practice and then at the very end i think it's useful to talk about mass uh, casualty situations because that's another area where this damage control approach uh, can be very useful so let's start off with the origin of the, the term damage control well it, this is actually a naval term so it comes from the u.s uh, navy the United States entered World War II in 1940, December 1941 when Pearl Harbor was bombed. And essentially, uh, they, uh, the, the US Navy had to come up with strategies to try and keep their fleet uh, fighting and to avoid uh, the, uh, the loss of warships. And they basically narrowed it down to several criteria that causing their ships to uh, be lost. One of them was flooding, one of them was breakage uh, of the ship, so breaking up, one of them was severe fires on board, and uh, the last one was explosions within the magazine where, where the ammunition was being kept. And of course, because it's a, a fighting force, what they want to do is to return that ship to war fighting as soon as possible, and uh, that means preventing the ship from sinking. And so they developed tactics really to allow them to stop the ship from sinking. So the first one is to maintain stability uh, of the ship, to fight fires on board, try and prevent explosions, especially in the magazine, and also have particular means for repairing battle damage. And they actually had um, officers on board whose job it was, was just, to, they were called damage control officers, and all they were supposed to do was to organize uh, the recovery of the vessel to stop it from sinking and essentially to live to fight another day. And in these pictures here, you can see um, you know, some uh, sailors using a box to try to uh, close a, a, a rent in the hull. And on the right, you can see someone trying to um, uh, stop a leak. And you know there are lots of parallels uh, with orthopedics. So if we think about orthopedics, what, when we talk about damage control, what we're trying to do is to preserve life in our polytraumatized patient. And it, just as with ships, you know that what they want to do is to live to fight another day. We want our patient to live to fight another day. So we've got to use a series of tactics to try to preserve our patient's life. And that's tr by trying to prevent them from developing adult respiratory distress syndrome or multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, or um, uh, you know, basically by controlling their physiology. Um, we want to control hemorrhage. We want to try and avoid uh, clotting disorders. 
and we want to stabilize their long bones because long bones will bleed, they'll cause pain, and uh, there's a risk of fat embolism as well. So what we're trying to do with damage control orthopedics is do the minimum amount to try and preserve our patient's life. Uh, and we're going to talk about the second inflammatory hit a little bit later, but we're trying to get our patient to live to fight another day, just like with the ships. So let's uh, go to a poll. And uh, uh, as always, there's uh, uh, these polls are anonymous. We don't know what uh, answers individuals have given. And it's just useful for you to know uh, how, you know, what you think compares with what other people are thinking. And also, um, you know, it gives us an idea of uh, what you're thinking and then we can try and uh, uh, um, uh, focus on those areas. So, so far, uh, everyone uh, has said that trauma is the uh, biggest cause of uh, death in the under 40s. And nobody's gone for cancer or infectious disease or heart disease. So we'll give you a little bit more time if there's, uh, there's still a few people who haven't voted. So, so Rahil, um, which one of those answers are you going to choose? Which is the biggest threat to life in the under 40s? Uh, the so are you muted at the moment? I can't hear you. I think I'm going with the audience there. So that's 100% for trauma. Absolutely. Okay. So, yeah, trauma is the biggest killer for the under 40s. And even in the under 80s, it's the third biggest killer. So what I thought we should do is talk about the evolution of damage control. And uh, I thought that one way that we could try and remember this is by looking at hairstyles over the last uh, 50 years as well. You, you had quite so, a beard there, uh, Mr. Shoaib, back in the 70s. I had a bit more of a beard as well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a typical haircut from the, uh, the 1970s. And as we said, you know, trauma is the biggest cause of mortality in the under 40s. But in the 1970s, it, there wasn't any clarity in how we should be approaching these polytraumatized patients. Um, it was noticed that uh, patients who underwent early fixation seemed to have problems. And those problems uh, seem to be things like fat embolism. So fat embolism basically means that in the, the long bones, um, if they were manipulated or if they were penetrated by uh, intramedullary nails, people uh, suffered showers of fat emboli that went up through the venous circulation and it could cause a fat uh, uh, embolus syndrome and uh, compromise the lungs and uh, this might be mechanical so it might be that there are physically bits of fat going in and blocking vessels in the lungs and causing mechanical damage or it may be because of um, uh, a biochemical reason that the free fatty acids themselves are causing uh, uh, damage within the lungs but either way it caused a uh, severe inflammatory reaction within the lungs and uh, this uh, led to um, multi-organ failure. So it, it was felt in the 1970s that there were some patients who were polytraumatized who were actually too sick to have surgery and if we operated on them we were going to get a bad result. So it, it tend to, patients tended to be kept on bed rest and then, you know, after a, a significant period of you know, nearly a week, then they might have their definitive surgery because it was thought that it was safer than having the early surgery. So let's move on from the 1970s. Um, it was uh, noticed that uh, some, uh, in some patients, uh, if early stabilisation within 24 hours, and there were lots of uh, papers that uh, demonstrated this, it actually reduced the fat embolism rather than making it worse. So there was a change in the way that people thought. And it seemed that patients who had their surgery within 24 hours seemed to do better than those who had their surgery after 48 hours or 72 hours. So they developed a new approach, which was called early total care. And what that involved was uh, 
all the, the patient would go to the operating theatre and if they had three or four different fractures they would all they would stay in the operating theatre until all of those had been addressed so all the long bones had been fixed and whereas in the sort of 1970s we thought that patients were too sick to have surgery because of the risk of fat emboli the changing th uh, the thought uh, process changed and now we're considering that patients uh, would be were too sick not to have surgery so they were going to benefit from having this surgery and one of the knock-on effects was that it allowed patients to rehab better and it was certainly true uh, that there was some improvement so bonus health in 1989 showed that there were less pulmonary uh, complications after patients had been treated for uh, bilateral femoral fractures and their, spend, their, 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 their uh, time spent on intensive care and in hospital seemed to decrease. So the, this seemed to really justify the approach of early total care um, from the 1970s to the 1980s. So this is the typical haircut from the 1980s, the mullet. Uh, did you have one of those, Raheel? I, was, uh, I wasn't born in the 80s, uh, Amir. Oh, that, that hurts. <laughs> that hurts. Right. So... Early total care in the 1980s, um, quite the, it wasn't just the early total care approach, there, there were other changes. So ATLS was uh, introduced, certainly in the UK in the, in the late 1980s. The fixation technique, so nailing became a lot more uh, common and the instrumentation was a lot more reliable. So there were you know, operations didn't take as long. And also we were better at uh, ventilating patients and uh, supporting them from a cardiorespiratory point of view. So there were other things as well which um, might have benefited patients as well as the early total care approach. But uh, even so, there were some patients who didn't seem to benefit from this early total care. And these patients were the ones who were unstable hemodynamically for some reason, who had a high injury severity score, patients who had chest injuries and patients who were hypovolemic, so still shocked. So there was a bit of head scratching and uh, it was felt that there, were, there was something more to it than early total care. And the reason, uh, the reason uh, that it's thought that there was this, was this problem was because of the inflammatory cascades. So the body has some very complex inflammatory cascades of uh, reaction and then counter reaction uh, with uh, of the increase and decrease in inflammatory mediators and essentially when you have multiple injuries your body produces um, uh, an inflammatory response to trauma so you have these cytokines floating around now um, if you uh, have a certain level of cytokines floating around that's obviously damaging to your body uh, because it's been caused by injury if you then go ahead and you operate on people and you perform extensive surgery and you cause lots of fat emboli then there's a risk that you're you've got a patient who's already got very high levels of cytokines and you're then going to give them another stimulus that's going to raise their cytokine level even higher and we call that the second hit uh, and with COVID you know we, we're all a bit more familiar with the, the term cytokine storm so certain cytokines just seem to get, get elevated and it, this was associated with the uh, systemic inflammatory reaction syndrome multi-organ dysfunction syndrome adult respiratory distress syndrome whatever you want to call it but it was also associated with patient death and so uh, there was another group of patients who were treated non-operatively or without IM nailing. And instead of having the second hit, they had a diff another cascade of count compensatory anti-inflammatory uh, 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 cytokines was released. And um, the, again, it's the balance between you know, what might be termed good cytokines and bad cytokines. But if you had uh, a balance, uh, which was physiological, then it would actually lead to resolution. But if you had uh, too much of a compensatory anti-inflammatory response, that actually left you open to, uh, well, you, beca you became immunosuppressed and it made you more susceptible to infection. So 
you know, you can have um, you know poor outcomes that way as well. But this is the 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 um, origin of the term second hit uh, with the cytokines going up. And so it was noticed uh, in patients who had uh, been treated with early total care that not everybody did well. So Eke et al. Sort of noticed that some patients were unstable. They had early total care as, a, as it was advocated in the, in the 80s, but they still had a lot of pulmonary problems. And uh, Junudis uh, uh, suggested that one of the reasons that this may be the case is because of the immunological response that we, we've talked about, the cytokines. And if we understand the cytokines more, perhaps we can understand how we can um, modulate this immune response so that we don't cause as much harm to our patients so we can avoid fat embolism uh, and you know that would help if we can control the base excess and the lactate that would certainly help and also interestingly interestingly the timing of surgery so that was honed down a little bit more um, uh, uh, um, uh, in detail so that we could see when it was that people's cascades of inflammatory uh, mediators were causing a problem. So from that two hips phenomenon, we developed the uh, the damage control orthopedics approach uh, in the 90s and the noughties. And there's, there's the haircut from the, uh, the 90s. Did you have a haircut like that in the uh, 90s, Raheel? Probably did. Uh, I mean, I probably did. Okay. So what we're trying to do is to get a, the, use the smallest intervention to get the maximum effect. So it's not just one thing, it's a whole barrage of uh, treatment. So we want to control hemorrhage and we want to resuscitate the patient properly. We want to think about the timing of the stabilization of the bone. So Pape uh, basically said, if we look at the timings, less than 24 hours is good. Um, between days two and four, there's a problem with uh, the, the second hit and the patient's very susceptible to having excessive levels of cytokines and then it's a, safer after day five to perform uh, the definitive surgery. So for the stabilization we're going to use external fixation rather than the inter intramedullary nails so that we can protect the patient from the cytokine storm and uh, also think about other risk factors for the systemic inflammatory reaction syndrome. And Pape came up with uh, uh, a series of categories for how we could sort of define patients and he worried about coagulopathy, hyperthermia and acidosis which we now would term the terrible triad of resuscitation. So these are the things that we're worried about because it forms um, a cyclical process which results in um, uh, worsening of the coagulopathy of the uh, myocardial function with um, low temperature, poor coagulation and metabolic acidosis. We're also worried about hypovolemia and hemodynamic instability. You'd be concerned about long surgical times because all of this could lead to the, the cytokine storm that we're trying to avoid. So we've got another poll now for everyone to uh, answer. So uh, there's a 42 year old man, he's been stabbed multiple times in the legs. The paramedics uh, say that there's been a lot of blood at the scene um, and when he comes in he's uh, tachycardic and he's hypotensive and if you you're going to stop his bleeding because it's really important that uh, we turn off the tap but we need to fluid resuscitate him because he's uh, lost a lot of volume so what are we going to use to resuscitate him so uh, we could use a uh, warmed Hartman's uh, solution that will uh, boost his volume we can get that in very quickly or we could use colloid and the argument that people use for using colloid is that it's the, the, the Hartmann's will redistribute very quickly into the whole uh, body uh, and the colloid will stay in the intravascular compartment so it will maintain his blood pressure. And uh, the last answer is th uh, that we would use blood 
platelets and FFP in the ratio one to one to one in order to resuscitate the patient. So what are your thoughts about this, uh, Rahil? So this is a young person and he's not on the borderline. He's actually in shock and air. If you look at the ATLS classification because he's tachycardic and he's hypotensive because as a young person, you'd expect them to compensate and keep the dynamic sticking along. But he's in, uh, he's pretty much uh, at the edge. Uh, so I, I, I would go with blood in this case because you want to get, get uh, FFPs, platelets and uh, packed uh, red blood cells in as quickly as possible because he, he's, he's one to watch. He's going to crash on, uh, on us any moment. I agree, absolutely. So it, it, it just makes sense, doesn't it? If you've lost blood, you need to replace it with blood. And um, the problem with giving just packed red blood cells is that that's not going to help with his clotting. Um, so he needs to have the platelets and FFP as well so that, you know, he can form blood clots um, and, you know, you're going to maintain his uh, intravascular volume. And I'm pleased to see that um, the vast majority of uh, our audience have agreed that um, the way to resuscitate someone in this situation is with blood platelets and FFP. So we're moving on to 2020. So uh, this is our current haircut. Uh, the um, uh, hipster type appearance. Um, so we're now looking at resuscitation in 2020. What are we going to do? Well, we, we've talked about this before. Uh, if you've got penetrating trauma, if you've got an amputated limb and you're worried about someone bleeding out and you can do something quick like put on a tourniquet or use some sea locks uh, or direct pressure, then you can do that and then go on to airway breathing circulation. But for blunt trauma, generally, we're going to just go with airway breathing uh, circulation. We want to stop the bleeding uh, with whatever tactics are possible. And you know, one way of doing that is uh, by stabilizing the long bones. Um, and we want uh, to replace blood with blood. So this is what we've just talked about in the last poll, FFP, packed red blood cells and platelets. And uh, tranexamic acid, is pretty much routine now for these trauma patients. So the CRASH-2 trial basically said, it seemed to conclude that it was in general a very good thing for these trauma patients to uh, stop them from um, breaking up uh, any uh, uh, clots that have formed that might st uh, be uh, plugging their bleeding points. And most hospitals have now got a, a massive transfusion protocol. So, you know, it, instead of having to think about how much blood you need, you know, it, they all come in packs now. So it makes it a little bit easier for you to, to manage. And everyone is singing from the same point. So here's another poll. So we'd like everyone to uh, answer this question. This is uh, another case from my own uh, experience. 25 year old policeman was riding a motorbike and uh, she hit a van in front of her. Now, as you know, a motorbike um, will have a big petrol tank in between uh, the rider's legs and so you slide forward and you tend to cause uh, injuries to your pelvis. And she's brought in with pain in the pelvic area. She's tachycardic and she's a little bit uh, um, hypotensive so the question is how much blood can you lose from your pelvic cavity so we've got 500 mils 1000 mils 1500 mils or 2000 mils so two liters the majority are going what with uh, two liters plus yeah so i think you know the vast majority of the audience have got this mm -hmm. Uh, they're all right. Uh, you can lose much more than two litres uh, in the pelvis. Uh, and the reason is that uh, if you consider the pelvis to be a sphere, uh, the formula for uh, the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. Am I right, Rahel? Four, four thirds so pi r cubed. Yes. So if you double the volume, you get, uh, if you double the radius, you get eight times the volume. So if you have an open book pelvis, as this as suggested by this question, then 
you'd actually increase the volume of the pelvis quite a lot and you can lose a lot of blood. And I'd agree, you know, it's it's two litres or more. So this is where as orthopaedic surgeons, we can sort of get involved in the C4 circulation and hemorrhage control because you've got to turn the tap off, you've got to stop them from bleeding and you also want to resuscitate them. The pelvis can lose two to four litres and the femur can lose 1.5 litres. So if you've got bilateral femoral fractures, you could easily lose three litres. So it's very, if you've got multiple long bone fractures, you could lo easily lose your entire blood volume, circulating volume in your long bones. And uh, this was actually something that was really important in World War One. So the Thomas Splint was introduced in World War One, and that actually resulted in sort of uh, the rate of death from open femoral fractures being from 80% and it reduced it down to 15%. And, you know, the other areas that you might be bleeding, uh, the, the pelvis, well, you can use the pelvic binder to decrease the volume of the pelvis by closing the book. Uh, and other things that you can use are things like a C-clamp or a pelvic fixator. And we talk about the concept of a primary clot. So when you uh, bleed into your pelvis, it might clot. Um, but if you elevate the blood pressure a bit too much, that might actually blow that primary clot. And if you don't have any more blood uh, clotting factors because you've used them all in that primary clot, then you haven't got the ability to clot again. So that's why it's important to have the FFP in the platelets as well. If you've got retroperitoneal bleeding, as orthopedic surgeons or, or uh, general surgeons, you could um, pack the uh, pelvis by uh, performing a lower uh, abdominal uh, laparoscopy, going behind the bladder and just packing lots of swabs behind the bladder to sort of uh, tamponade it. And um, the long bones, you know, we can use external fixation or the Thomas splint to uh, basically splint them out, and that will help with um bleeding instead of nailing which could actually make them bleed more so it it was noticed that by applying this damage control um dogma to everybody actually it didn't make a difference to everyone and there were some patients who didn't need to have damage control because they weren't actually ill enough so they, they were actually stable they could go ahead and have their nailing straight away because their their physiology could take it. And the other thing that's a little uh, bit concerning is that all those inflammatory mediators that we thought we were going to control, no one's actually demonstrated that those inflammatory mediators are going down or that we're stopping them from going up. So it's still a little bit confusing. And maybe, like with lots of things, we don't actually understand all these cascades as well as we think we do. Um, and uh, there's still a lot of work. And in 10 years time, we might actually believe something different again. But what we do know is that um, you know, early appropriate care, choosing whether the patient has early total care or whether they have damage control, depends on the individual patient and their physiology. And we know that things like head injuries or thoracic injuries or hypervolemia make a, a difference. But what we would what would be useful for us as orthopedic surgeons is to be able to define which patients need each particular approach and what we could use uh, clinically to try and make that decision. And fortunately, you know, clever people have, have done that work for us. So Pape and Giannoudis have sort of led the way in talking about damage control and uh, about the limitations of that as well as uh, um, uh, defining who would benefit from it. So if we've got a patient who's stable, who doesn't have life-threatening injuries, well, you can, first of all, you're going to do a pan CT. You want to CT them from head to toe so you can identify all their injuries. And if they don't have life-threatening injuries, then you can use early total care. If you've got a patient who's in extremis, so they uh, are, they come in, they're shocked, they don't respond to um, a fluid challenge, they're decompensating, then that's the other end of the scale. You don't want to do early total care for them because that's going to lead to death. In fact, in those patients who are non-responders, you don't even want to do a CT. 
you want to get them to theatre and you're going to use surgery to resuscitate those patients. So this is what we would call a, a code red uh, patient uh, in my hospital. And then you've got the other groups, uh, an unstable group of patients who respond transiently to uh, a fluid challenge uh, to that to, to the blood uh, and the resuscitation. These patients need to have a pan CT so you can identify where their injuries are and they need damage control because there's still other work to do to uh, try and stabilize them and they're the ones who are more at risk of uh, developing ARDS. And then you have the borderline patients who are responders to resuscitation um, but you know they could go either way so they might improve or they might deteriorate and these patients need to have a pan CT from head to toe and then we need to have some other means of being able to determine whether they get early total care, if their physiology is fine, or whether they get damage control, if we're concerned that they might deteriorate from early total care. So fortunately, PAPE has um, defined these uh, characteristics really clearly for us. Um, the things that I'd like to bring out from this slide are the ones in red. So if you've got a patient who's got a chest injury, then, uh, so with the abbreviated injury score of you know two or more, uh, and that means they've got multiple rib dis uh, fractures which are displaced or they've got flail chest. These patients are likely to do worse if you um, try early total care. So they may be the patients who need to have damage control. And similarly, if you've got abdominal trauma uh, with a, a high AES, these patients you need to manage with damage control to try to um, limit the amount of uh, uh, inflammatory uh, cytokines floating around in their body, which might make them deteriorate. O'Toole has also given us of other ways that we can look at uh, patients and define what kind of uh, treatment they have. So if they're lactate, uh, is less than two milligrams per deciliter, then O'Toole says, well, actually they're, they're fine, uh, they're relatively stable and you can give them early total care. Um, if they have a lactate which is more than 2.5, then you need to continue to resuscitate them because you, you haven't uh, finished resuscitating them and you need to use damage control, uh, so using external fixation rather than intramedullary nailing. And if they're somewhere in between, that's the grey area. And what we need to do is watch the, the trend in the lactate. So we carry on resuscitating the patient to try to drive the lactate down. And if they're getting better, then they might be a candidate for early total care. But if they're deteriorating, then we need to use damage control so that the patient can live to fight another day. Another uh, aspect um, of the, the patient's care that we need to think about is their coagulation and the clotting cascade. And there are new things that we can use to uh, help us decide how we need to resuscitate the patient. So uh, there's TEG is one uh, means of doing it and there's ROTEM which is a, a similar kind of um, uh, clinical uh, bedside test and it gives you a result within about 30 minutes. and Essentially what it does, it looks at blood clotting uh, and it agitates the blood clot and it measures the viscosity and that viscosity is going to change over time. And the things that we want to know is uh, are how fast does the clot form, which is our R value. And if the, the TEG says that the R value is prolonged, that means we're taking too long to clot then we need to give the patient um, uh, flesh, uh, fresh flow, frozen plasma. Another uh, question we might ask is how strong is the clot? So we might be forming a clot, but is that clot going to be strong enough? Now, a clot is made up of platelets and fibrin, which sort of glues all the platelets together. So if there's a problem with either of those components, then we might have clots forming, but they're just not very durable or strong and they're not going to be able to um, uh, plug uh, holes and stop bleeding. So 
uh, if we look at another parameter called maximum amplitude, which is MA uh, on the tag, then it might indicate that there's a problem with platelets or um, with uh, um, the uh, clotting factors. So it might uh, uh, of a fibrinogen. So we might need to give uh, cryoprecipitate if the fibrinogen is low, or we might need to give platelets if uh, the uh, fibrinogen is normal, and we're inferring that the uh, the platelets must be low. And then the last thing we want to know is how uh, long is the clot going to be durable? Because there are cascades involved in uh, the coagulation as well. So you've got the uh, plasminogen to plasmin cascade. So the, that's going to cause our blood clot to be degraded. So we can look at things like the LY30, which will tell if, if that's um, uh, too high, then that means that there's too much lysis of the blood clot, it's too quick, and that's actually degrading our blood clot and stopping it from uh, um, maintaining uh, uh, um, sort of coagulation. So for that, we need to give tranexamic acid. Now, uh, if you've got a patient who's on the novel anticoagulants like dabigatran, there's a specific reversal agent for that. But the other uh, novel anticoagulants, the factor 10A inhibitors, there's nothing for that. So that produces a particular problem with our patients who are just going to bleed a lot. I think you know what it's clear. What what's clear is that actually we need to think a lot more than just orthopedics. You know, orthopedics is not just about fixing the bones anymore. We actually need to think about a little bit more. Um, this last slide um, has got a lot of relevance for uh, Rahil and me because we we're involved in uh, dealing with patients from the Manchester bombing. Um, and the mass casualty situation might need you to use the um, damage control kind of approach. And what we're trying to do is to operate on as many people as possible to stabilize them. And we want to get the biggest benefit for the biggest number. So we might start off by triaging them to prioritize them. Uh, but we're rather than using intramedullary nails, which take too long and um, you know, might make some patients worse. We're going to treat everybody with uh, external fixation because it allows us to rapidly stabilize them and then get them out of theatre and move on to the next patient so we can treat as many patients as possible. Uh, and uh, uh, sorry, just to, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we seem to have lost, uh, we your, seem video. To have lost your video. You can hear you fine. Right, sorry. Um, and if we can treat all the patients uh, rapidly, then we can stabilize them and come back to them later and we can perform their definitive fixation. So whereas with damage control, we're normally looking at their physiology and their lactate and their coagulation, we're actually going to ignore all of that and we're just going to stabilize them to get as much as possible, uh, get as many patients through theater as possible in the shortest possible time. So. In summary, we've gone through the strategies that have been used over the last 40, or 40 years for treating these polytraumatized patients. We've gone from the 1970s where we weren't really sure, the 1980s where we went to early total care, and the 90s and the, the noughties when we used damage uh, control orthopedics, and now up to date with what we call early appropriate care, depending on the patient's physiology. And we've got means of deciding how we're going to treat patients based on their, their physiology. But it's still very clear that uh, we don't understand everything about trauma responses and about the physiology and the pathophysiology. And I think we just need to reiterate what we're doing in orthopedics is we're trying to save life and trying to save limb. We're trying to get the patient to live to fight another day with this uh, CABCD uh, approach. So that's the end of my talk, but I'm just going to use this opportunity to just mention a charity that we run uh, called OrthoCycle. And what we do in OrthoCycle is we take single use devices from uh, the UK, things like um, old uh, rings and old instruments and even old um, uh, power tools like these pneumatic tools. And we take them to uh, less developed countries uh, so that they can be used there. 
We also organize uh, courses. Uh, so uh, this is a course that Rahil and I have uh, run in Manchester, um, external fixation courses and foot and ankle surgery courses. And the other thing we do is uh, we treat um, uh, people who don't have access to orthopedics for free. So uh, our current sort of uh, uh, aim is to treat Syrian refugees and uh, people from Tanzania and we treat them for free. So that's the end of uh, my talk, but we're going to go through a few more cases with Rahil now. Uh, thank you, Amir, for a really uh, informative talk uh, passing the entire spectrum of damage control orthopedics. Just so that we can summarize for our uh, participants today, when we're looking at the treatment algorithm for these patients who come with polytrauma, uh, I'm just going to go through this with you and you can sort of refine as we speak. We want to assess if this patient is stable and then he gets a uh, early total care, which is fixing every uh, fracture in one sitting and get them up and get them going. We want to assess if they're borderline or unstable. And based on that, if they're borderline, we consider early appropriate care, correct? And yeah. if they're unstable, we just go for damage control orthopedics. And how we differentiate the borderlines from the stables is whether you're able to resuscitate the patient appropriately and they respond to your resuscitation within 12 hours. Uh, if they have a, a closed head injury, they straight away go into the uh, unstable category, correct? Or a chest injury. Um, and early appropriate care, uh, for those of uh, our colleagues who joined us a little late, is when you decide to fix the femur definitively and treat all the other uh, bone fractures with either splints or external fixators. Is that is that a, a reasonable uh, synopsis? That's a really good, good concise uh, uh, summary. Yeah, okay. thanks, Rahil. Great. So what we're going to do is going to have a quick look at a couple of cases before we wrap up to see what we've learned and whether we can implement some of the things we've uh, discussed. So here is our case number two. This is a 58 year old who has been run over by a bus and she has severe bilateral lower limb injuries. Tonicase have been applied and she has a hemoneumothorax. She has been intubated on scene and she's been brought into uh, the emergency uh, room. What are our priorities? So we're going to push this poll to you. We're going to assess the C-spine first. We're going to insert a chest drain, resuscitate with fluids or wound dressings. So this is uh, someone who's had a chest injury, Amir. So by default, this lady falls into the uh, possibly borderline or unstable patient, correct? Absolutely, We yes. don't want to go in there and start nailing these femurs and add insult to the... Uh, Traumatized lungs. traumatized lungs absolutely yes so there's a hemoneumothorax yeah. so you know immediately you know we know that uh, the, the chest injury is going uh, uh, um, compromising her uh, lungs and if we nail her then it's going to result in a second hit and we're going to make her uh, chest injury worse okay. and you know, if, if we if we see um, there are a lot of people who've uh, decided that they're going to look at the cervical spine. Um, other people have said that they're going to insert a chest drain and others still have said that they'd go for fluid resuscitation. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a widespread, really. It is, isn't it? It's, it's interesting. What, what are your thoughts? Well, what would you um, yeah, she's been run over by a bus. Um, the... We're going to go with uh, airway breathing circulation and yes we're going to think about airway with cervical spine control but i think you know if she's been hit by a bus if there's a cervical spine injury it's probably going to be there whatever happens and i'm not going to be really assessing the cervical spine i'm just going to immobilize it and ignore it because that's not an immediate priority um and then i'm going to move on to b for breathing and I can see on that CT scan that the, the, the patient's supine and there's blood collecting at the back of the thorax and there's really a really significant uh, pneumothorax there as well. So um, I think, you know, uh, decompressing that is probably going to be my priority. So I, I'd, uh, if there was a sign of a tension pneumothorax, uh, then I would decompress that with a needle. 
uh, and then I'd move on to putting in uh, an intercostal chest drain. Uh, I, I agree with what, what you're saying, absolutely. I think, uh, understandably, uh, some of the audience has gone with the ATLS protocol of C spine first, um, but she's been tubed. So, you, although you don't assume in trauma, uh, as you say, the priority is the chest because she's got a tube. Uh, she's she's not her GCS is down to three now, so she's not going to be moving her neck anytime soon. So let's get that chest decompressed and then move on to uh, going through the algorithm. Okay. So moving along, so a chest drain has been inserted and we've got 200 mils of blood which we've drained. It's now bubbling around nicely and she has been resuscitated with blood. Her pulse is 120, her blood pressure is 110 by 60, but she's at acidotic at the pH of 7.24. Her lactate is raised at 4. Now her TEG and uh, NA, as you rightly discussed um, earlier, these new clotting uh, tools that we use are low. She's hypothermic. What does she need now? So let's have a poll with our audience. She needs to go to the ITU. We consider damage control orthopedics, correct her coagulopathy, continue resuscitating her with fluids, uh, possibly blood, a warming blanket and temperature control, or all of the above. So what's the concern with this patient, Amir? There's, there's alarm bells ringing here. Oh, Happy alarm bells be, everywhere. Happy will be alarmed, won't he? So, uh, the, the approach seems to be good. She's been resuscitated with blood. Uh, and she's made some kind of response. So although she's uh, um, uh, still tachycardic, she's got a blood pressure of, uh, you know, which is quite reasonable, really. But the thing that concerns me is that she's got uh, an acidosis, presumably a metabolic acidosis. Um, there's, she's got a coagulopathy because that, that's what the tech is there to show us that there's a problem with uh, her coagulation. And, and she's also hypothermic. And that is the terrible triad. Um, so each one of those uh, is bad enough, but all three together is worse than the, the sum of them. And she's got a lactate of four, so there's still some resuscitation that needs to be done as well. So she, this is a very sick patient. Uh, so ITU, she's very sick. Of course, she needs to go to ITU at some point. Damage control, well, we know that she's got uh, quite severe injuries to her lower limbs and uh, she'd probably be bleeding from those and those limbs are probably responsible for a lot of inflammatory cytokines and uh, she's got a coagulopathy um, continuous resuscitation we've said you know she needs because she's still uh, not fully resuscitated she's got high, lact uh, high lactate and uh, she's still tachycardic and she's cold. So I would actually agree with most of the audience, which is uh, who have all plumped for all of the above, because all of those things are important for the management of this patient. And a lot of the time they're happening in parallel. Yeah. Yeah. So agree with that. So all of the above is the right answer to that one. So unfortunately for this poor soul, things aren't getting any better. We've taken her to theatre now, and her right leg is severely injured. There is no pulse in the foot. What's your uh, procedure of choice now? We're going to push that poll to the audience and let's uh, have a think through this. We apply an X, X fix and give her temporary stability. We call a vascular surgeon to revascularize the limbs. Perform an above knee amputation or replace the tourniquet because it will uh, stem the bleeding. So this is a tricky one. She's quite unstable. And we've just discovered now that there is no pulse in that foot. What do you think we should do? So it's interesting, 60, uh, close to 70%. Oh, it's ticking along now. We've got about 55% of our audience saying they would call the vascular surgeon. Uh, a third of the audience are saying they will do uh, an above knee amputation. So that's where the split is. Amir, your thoughts? Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking at that picture, and what I see are very, very badly traumatized limbs. And uh, the right leg is the one where there's no pulse. And I can see that there's a distal femoral fracture, there's a proximal tibial fracture, 
there's a shaft a fracture um i think that you know the the soft tissues as well also look very severely traumatized you know this is a, a mangled extremity and this is a patient who's very sick you know they've got a lactate of four they uh, are acidotic they've got a coagulopathy so um what we don't want is for them to spend a long time in theater but as well as that you know what we don't want is um to um potentiate or make worse any of the current problems so um a lot of the audience have gone for calling a vascular surgeon to revascularize but for the for a vascular surgeon to revascularize you know the, the, we've talked in uh, the open fracture um uh, discussion that we need to shunt first then we need to put an x-fix on then we get a definitive vascular repair but that's going to take a long time that patient's going to be in theater for more than six hours and that leg is so mangled i don't think that the, the, the there's going to be anything to salvage so i personally wouldn't say that the vascular surgeon is going to be able to revascularize that limb uh, because if uh, they did try to do that and they spend four or five hours in theater this patient's going to just deteriorate and die so i think uh, in this particular situation with that degree of trauma and with the physiological parameters that we've discussed it's not worth revascularizing this limb now um, going to go with an above knee amputation. I think that that would be my choice, uh, and the reason is that putting an external fixator on. We've already, I've already said this limb is trashed, and I don't think it can be salvaged. So I don't that's, think putting that's, an external that's quite, a, that's quite a, an important decision you're taking there. Absolutely, the practical I, and implications of that for a lay, uh, for anyone are significant. It's a, it's beyond life altering. So let's just think, tease that concept out a little more. In real life terms, you've said this is a mangled extremity. So we need to be clear in our mind, and the audience needs to be clear in their mind what what a mangled extremity actually means. It doesn't. It's not just looks like spaghetti. So the definition of a mangled extremity is we've got bone, soft tissue, nerve, and vessels. If three of those are beyond uh, repair, they're trashed, that's the definition of a mangled extremity. So uh, Amir is going to look at that limb, he's going to assess, are the bones okay? Are they worth salvaging? Is the soft tissue uh, worth salvaging or is it salvageable? Uh, if there's significant loss of soft tissue, is the nerve or the blood vessels, are they salvageable? If three of those aren't, then it's mangled extremity. So that's one step you have cleared. This is a mangled extremity, you say, fair play. Then moving on to taking that big decision of performing an amputation, would you would you consider getting a second opinion in absolute in theatre? Yes, yeah. And that's safe so, practice, isn't it? Yes. So let's yeah. say it's so, two o'clock in the morning. How would you go about doing that, Amir? So well, if the vascular surgeon was there, I'd be saying to the vascular surgeon, "What do you think the prognosis is for this limb? Do you agree that in this particular situation?" it's better for the patient to lose the leg. Uh, and also the anaesthetist would be there and perhaps other trauma surgeons would uh, also be there. And you're right, we need to get a consensus because if we're making a decision of this gravity, we really need to be sure what we're doing and it's not a one person decision. And, and we've, we've all been there, <coughs> middle of the night, we've sometimes had to pick up the phone and speak to a colleague who's asleep in bed saying this is the situation, this is what we're planning, and pretty much get consensus. And it doesn't take long to do that, even in an unstable patient. Okay, so I think we're in agreement and above knee amputation in this instance in a highly unstable patient with the triad is, is best to essentially save her life. And finally, with uh, she's in ITU, so yes, she's had a, an amputation, as you can see. Um, and that's day three in the ITU now. Now you're on your round and the ITU consultant tells you, you know what, we've got to get this uh, other female fixed because she's been here for three days. Um, what would you choose to do? Let's uh, get the audience uh, involved here. You would choose to nail her if her lactate is below 2.5 or if her PO2 is more than five, 
or consider doing it after day five or after day 14. So uh, let's see what the, uh, give the uh, audience a moment to take their pick. So you mentioned about this borderline patient and stable patient and the concept of a uh, second hit. Now I know there's enough evidence out there which seems to suggest that if you wait for a certain period of time, your inflammatory response sort of dies down and that second hit won't be as massive as if you operated earlier. So what would, uh, bearing that in mind, Amir, what would you go for? Would you consider well, lactate? It's important, yes. <clears throat> Uh, lactate uh, is something that we would definitely monitor, but um, Pape uh, you know, de defined that between days uh, two and four, that's actually a, a dangerous time to uh, perform definitive surgery on a patient, especially one who's been unstable and has got altered uh, uh, physiology. So I think uh, the, the first two, Obviously, you know, we, we would be interested in a patient having a low lactate and um, being uh, well oxygenated, but we want to do it after day five. Now, after day 14, um, although her physiology may have improved, one of the problems of leaving an X fix on for day 14 is that you're worried about colonization. And I I know that Giannoudis uh, has written a paper which says that after 14 days, um, the uh, risk of infection uh, from converting an X-fix to an intramedullary renal really rises. So I would perhaps not wait as long as the day as day 14, but I would definitely wait uh, until after day five and hope that her physiology is sort of returns to normal with appropriate supportive treatment. So you're going with options saying after day five? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, agree. And just to reiterate, uh, any uh, practice should be dictated by evidence. And there's a paper by Bonatal, which uh, Amir has quoted in his uh, presentation. Uh, essentially, it looked at 178 patients and they randomized them, the polytrauma ones versus the uh, single isolated traumas. They took the polytrauma ones and studied them and they found that there was a 50% increase in hospital length of stay and 50% increase in morbidity uh, with chest infections if you operated on these patients after 24 hours but before fi uh, day 5. And beyond day 5, once you operated on them, all these factors significantly improved. So uh, I think you're right, Amir. We, we, we would all go with day 5. Vast majority have said uh, lactate below 2.5, which is appropriate as well but the timing is what we're trying to focus on the second hit preventing that second hit okay great one final uh, question with uh, we're going to share with our audience here is the last uh, case and we've got one question for you there so this is uh, a mass casualty uh, which occurs where you've had a bus which has fallen off a bridge barrier and you've got four dead at scene and 18 severely uh, injured patients and 14 walking wounded. So they're all coming into your hospital, which is the major trauma center. Um, the severely injured 14 of those are, sorry, 18 are being brought to your hospital. Your mass casualty plan has been activated and you're the uh, lead orthopedic sur uh, surgeon there taking over and uh, basically running the ops room. Now you've got to organize yourself uh, in the emergency room and you've got 10 patients with femoral fractures and eight patients with tibial fractures. Out of those 18 severely injured ones, 10 have femoral fractures and eight tibial. You've got four theaters or ORs available. What are you going to do? Now, once you get to the OR, you find you've got four femoral nailing sets and four tibial nailing sets and 10 X fix sets. Who will get the nails and who will get the X fixes? Okay, so how are you going to decide this? We're pushing that poll to you. Your options are assess their physiology and if lactate is below two, then nail, otherwise X fix. Option number two, everyone gets a nail. Option number three, everyone will have an X fix. Option number four, perform a triage and high, highest priority gets a nail. Or the last option, perform a triage and highest priority get an X fix. So this is a tricky one, Amir. You've got 18 patients who are severely wounded. 
and you've got a limited number of mailing sets and uh, expert sets. And this is this is what happens in the real world. This has happened uh, to us as well previously, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. It's a tricky time to be uh, involved in a mass casualty event. So how would you go about approaching this with your experience? Um, I think uh, we've got a, a large number of patients and we've got a limited amount of equipment. So because it's a bus crash, I uh, probably one of the first things I would be doing while I was waiting for the patients to arrive would be to actually ring other hospitals and uh, try to get them to send equipment because we're clearly going to run out of, of equipment. Uh, and you know, certainly in the UK, there are uh, store, storage facilities which have got um, uh, uh, emergency equipment that can be mobilised to uh, hospitals which are pre-sterilised, so they're, they're completely sterilised packs. Now, we've got a lot of patients who need to have surgery and I think I would definitely want to triage the patients to decide who's going to be treated first. So I'll use the ABCD approach to look at each individual patient and then I will um, uh, sort the patients into perhaps an order of who uh, is the most severely injured and needs to be treated first. But for these long bone fractures, um, if I do a femoral nailing, I know that in my hands, you know, it's going to take me you know, probably 90 minutes um, to two hours. Whereas if I put on an X fix, it's going to take me a lot less uh, time. And I've got a, a lot of patients to get through. Um, I want to have as many surgeons operating as possible. So I'd have four surgeons working in four operating rooms, but I'd want them all to use external fixation so that we can get through all the patients really quickly so we can stabilize them all and that will then just buy us some time we can then you know once we've stabilized everyone then we can go back and reassess them and uh stagger the uh, eventual definitive treatment uh and if there are patients who are compromised um and worried about their physiology then maybe they've got to wait for you know, more than five days until uh, they uh, are suitable to have certain, to have nailing, and the ones who are uh, not compromised, uh, you know, perhaps with an isolated injury and their physiology is okay, then they can go. They can be converted to uh, um, intramedullary nailing uh, as soon as possible. Um, so that uh, perhaps that answer isn't actually one of those there, but I, I would actually go for an X fix for everybody. Uh, in the first instance mm -hmm. so that, that that's a, that's a really uh, well thought out strategy uh, whilst we're finishing off just a quick question to you and I uh, please use the uh, chat uh, option to ask any questions you might have uh, whilst I pose this question to Amir Amir with regards to triage is there a difference in uh, civilian triage mass casualty triage could you just explain uh, a triage would be to get treat the sickest person as quickly as possible but there is a yeah. slight difference to the way we triage in uh, mass casualty events or in uh, uh, the military right yeah. yeah yeah so so when we triage people um we're we're sorting them into different groups as to how urgently they need to have treatment so um and it depends on whether we're uh, going to overrun the hospital's facilities so if the type of the patient or the uh, number of the patients are going to over, uh, uh, over in the hospital, then we need to sort the patients into a particular order. So a, a P1 patient is a patient who has, uh, who's compromised and need, they need to have surgery pretty much straight away. And then there will be the P3 patients who are the patients who are were walking wounded. And then, uh, Everybody in between who might have who who can't walk, but they're not uh, life threatening. That you know they would be P two, but they need to have early surgery as well. Um, so that's the the normal way that we would triage people. But if we get to a situation where uh, we're completely overrun, then there's a fourth category, the the P four category, which are patients who are severely ill, but the amount of time and uh, resources that are going to be spent to try to 
keep that patient alive is going to result in other patients possibly suffering. So it might, it might mean that they're going to take so long or they're so compromised that we can't possibly save them. And in that case, we would actually put them on hold and we go for the patients who we could save. So you try and save as many people so the, the greater good for the greater number. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, we've got to make those decisions that some patients um, we're not going to expend the time or the resources because it would result in overall less survivors. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Amir, that was a fantastic talk you've uh, given us and a, a great uh, way to sort of pin our colors to the mast when it comes to damage control orthopedics, the evolution of uh, early appropriate care and early total care. Uh, we've pushed a handout out to you. Uh, it's, uh, it's an article which uh, sort of highlights all the key uh, concepts. So please download that from the section in the handout section, which is coming up on your screen. Uh, and whilst we finish off, we've, that's, that's the end of our trauma series for now. Uh, we're moving on from next week to uh, a foot and ankle theme. And uh, please do register for this. Uh, we're going to be putting the link up on the uh, chat uh, option there for you. Uh, for those of you who haven't registered, please do. We're going to be discussing tailored defects and following that, moving on with some uh, list frank fractures, calcaneal fractures, and then looking at mobile flat feet. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed that session. Uh, please do feel free to uh, post any questions you have uh, whilst we wait and any closing uh, Thoughts, Amir, whilst we wait for any questions coming up? No, but thanks very much for, for you know, it's, it's been a really sort of interesting discussion that we've had today. And I'm looking forward to hearing you educating me about Taylor defects uh, next week, uh, because this is, uh, again, sort of a controversial area. Um, and, uh, you know, Rahil's, uh, over the years, he's been educating me and trying to drag me into the 21st century. Uh, so uh, I'm sure we'll be doing more of the same next, next week. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. I, I don't think there are any questions right now. So uh, hope you enjoyed that session. We look forward to seeing you next week. Goodbye. Thanks, Amir. Bye-bye.